The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I have leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll sell be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process and hopefully you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors or simply download the app. This series is brought to you by Hub24, one of Australia's leading providers of integrated platform, technology and data solutions to the wealth industry. By working with licensees and advisors, Hub24 is delivering innovative solutions and service excellence that enables you to do business your way, creating efficiencies for your business and value for your clients. These are just some of the reasons why advisors have rated Hub24 number one for value for money and best managed portfolio functionality six years running, empowering better financial futures together. Find out more at hub24.com.au. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm here with Morgan Haywood. Morgan is an advisor and director of financial planning at Yield Advisory. Morgan, great to have you on. Good morning, Ben. Thanks for having me. No, it's great to be chatting. Um, I, you know, in chatting a little bit offline, I feel like a lot of similarities in the journey that you're currently on and the the one that I've been on. So I'm keen to um, sort of, you know, scratch the surface on some of the things that you're working through at the moment. But I thought a good place to start is just, can you just, for people that uh, maybe didn't listen to your previous podcast or uh, haven't heard of you before, give us a short version of your advice journey and how you've ended up where you are today. Okay, my advice journey, I'm not sure how far back we want to go. Um, I started off my advice journey as a mortgage broker about 10 years ago. I always wanted to be an advisor, but I knew that I had to develop some skills. So I was mortgage broking for quite a while. You know, during that, you learn how to deal with human emotions. You learn how to read profit losses. Um, so I ended up going to quite a complex space with um, with finance. Then the firm I was at, they started offering financial planning, so I kind of learned all the back ropes of that. And um, then I moved into uh, moved into a different firm. I became an AR at a pretty <laughs> pretty horrific firm. <clears throat> but sometimes I learn more what not to do at those type of firms. Um, mm-hmm. Then I moved to another firm. I was there for a few years. I ended up heading the advice division there. Completely remodeled their business the way that they do advice. Um, and then a year and a half ago, I decided to take the leap of faith and we opened up Yield Financial Advisory. So Yield Financial Advisory, we um, we tacked on, well, I tacked on to an existing accounting firm that needed financial planning. So we opened up a separate entity and um, I do have a business partner in that. And we've been almost trading for a year and a half now. Awesome. And so you join an established accounting practice to build the financial advice arm of the business. Tell me, how did you how did you tackle things from the outset? How did the planning go? Um, and then what happened in the early days? Yeah, in the early days, it, it was a fair bit of planning to go into it because I think coming from, you know, my business partners, I actually have two business partners, they are accountants and business advisors and they kind of go, look, this is your space. You know, you can bounce ideas of us off us if you have them but you know how do you want your experience to look like they kind of gave me 100% control guess, guess I had a little bit of analysis paralysis but then I I think having a really good supportive network around me I was chatting to Fraser Jack you know um year and a half ago more than that and he's just like Morgan carve it from the back end 
through to experience. So what is the end result you want the clients to have? What do you want them to experience? And then create everything around that and start from the beginning. So, yeah, that was a fair bit of time getting that. How do I want to structure my packages? What kind of advice am I giving? What's the client base that I'm going to be advising to? What's the marketing strategy? So there was a fair bit of thought that went into that process. Um, and that, I guess a lot of that planning has kind of led to the success that I've seen today, um, just being really articulate, but then also learning from your mistakes and improving. Yeah, Those totally. Things. And you fast forward to today, you just mentioned uh, when we were chatting about 90 clients on uh, ongoing agreements that you're looking after, plus a handful of sort of ad hoc and uh, and insurance clients as well. So clearly it's working. What were the biggest challenges for you in the early days? In the early days, I think the first thing that I did, because I have worked in accounting firms pretty much my entire career, and I am aware of how that works. I think it was understanding the business model of yield, understanding the clients that they have, because they're very niche and we target some very specific markets there, understanding how that works, and then understanding the team. So the, I guess the first thing that I did what, what for the team was I understood that accountants naturally don't like referring. I thought that I was going to walk into a firm um, and day one they have a list of clients for me. Absolutely not. That wasn't how it was. I needed to kind of build their trust and build the client's trust over the journey. So the first thing that I actually did was I did a presentation to the team, to the accounting team about, you know, what I do, my processes, and I actually gave all of them free financial advice. So I did a, you know, SOA for every single team member. I took out any comms, anything, and I think seeing that as well was a really big thing for them going, hey, Morgan does a great job. And then as soon as I did that, then they started inviting me into client meetings. Um, and also some of the team that I have are referral machines as well. They go, oh, help my parents, help my friends. I think that was a really big key thing that I did really early on, that if I hadn't had done that, I probably wouldn't have seen the growth that I had at all in the first six months. Awesome. And yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think that when people are referring, when they do it from a place of experience, having gone through the process themselves, then they can talk about it for them. Uh, and that obviously then leads to more trust in, in the work that you're doing or in the process itself. Plus, they just understand it better so they can talk about where the value is coming from and, and what people should expect. What... Um, like I'm just thinking 18 months in to the work, I expect that you're, you know, it's, it's still sort of relatively early days, but what have been the biggest things that have changed or that you have decided to change over that time? The things that I've changed is I, we got, we have our own AFSL now. So that was a really big thing for me is I wanted to make my processes more efficient. I wanted to make the client experience better for me, um, not better, for me um, better for the client. And I you know that the AFSL that I was at, um, they were great. They've been really supportive of me, but just didn't, we didn't align anymore. So now I've got the AFSL. I think that's the biggest change. We were approved and we started with that October 1st. So I guess it's still a new learning experience. But I think it's just, again, staying to my goal of what I want my client to experience and then backtracking it from there. Now I've got a lot more opportunities um, for that. It's growing out the team, making sure you've got the right team in the right seats on the bus mm. and providing them growth and support opportunities and then also building out the next team. So my business partner always encourages me to think one year in advance, what do you want in one year? Start planning that now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like team is is the biggest challenge for any business and the biggest opportunity as well. Um, I know that you mentioned that you're you're bringing another advisor into the business in the in the near future, and I'm keen to dive into that. But in terms of your team and your support around that, obviously, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. A lot of different ways that people do do it. You know, with different levels of success. How, how did you tackle it? How did you figure out which people you know you bring in first, and which people you bring in after, and and how to create the the level of support to keep consistent with that experience that you want to give, but to drive efficiency as well. Yeah, I will say one of the key benefits of my previous experiences I've always done, and I've had exposure to the entire process. 
So from my end, I was never in a massive firm where I just did client meetings or I never just did X, Y or Z. I could do the entire process. I could do the admin. I could write my own SOAs. I can do my research. I'm quite versatile and I think that was my advantage. Although I didn't like it, I could go in and I knew exactly where to download what form from who who to contact so that helped me obviously grow quite quickly but I think the biggest thing is I wanted to bring in CSO um, and ad- administration support because I thought what is the job that I hate doing the most and it's calling product it's calling product providers on hold yeah. for an hour nothing mm-hmm. grinds like is more so I guess that was the the first key team member I brought in and then I brought in a power planner um, and then I've got also a part-time support as well and how have you gone about finding those people? Because obviously finding great people is a challenge and then bringing them in and setting them up for success is probably the next challenge. How have you tackled that? It's been a bit of a journey. Um, you know, initially, I like I will say I had a not a great experience, but I did bring someone in that I figured out probably wasn't the right person pretty quickly and I did have to part ways with them. Um you know, I'm very lucky that I've got a very good support network. Um, I guess the first if my CSO wasn't the right fit, I guess things could have unraveled pretty quickly. But my CSO mm-hmm. came in, was very good. I knew things were going to get done, which freed up capacity for me to then look at the power planning. Now, the power planning hasn't been, again, a smooth journey. Um, my power planner now, fight like we're at a place now, it's been six months where I am 90% confident in the work. Um, yeah. But again, that's been that's been a little bit of a journey. And how have you how have you gone about like onboarding the team into the business and into your process? Do you have a structure around that? Are you running it you know um, ad hoc based on the the individual? What yeah? What how are you how are you? Yeah, running? very very good point. Um, I guess yield itself. So the brand. So my business partners have a very. Um, great we have a great culture at yield so for example my business partner Lachlan spoke at the zero conference this year on culture um he was invited to speak there so they do a very good job over there so I guess I've just followed the procedures that they have which is slowly bringing people in doing multiple interviews introducing them early to the team making sure that they're a right cultural fit Mm because the last thing I want to do is go and undo everything that they've done um we do have you know, a general manager of the business. We've got a marketing um, HR. So I guess having come into a business that already has procedures in place for the firm was an advantage. I didn't need to go and create my own HR. I didn't need to go and create anything. I guess I had that support there. So I think slowly doing meetings, um, introducing that person to the team, you know, testing them, you know, what would you do in this situation? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it makes a big difference that that higher, slow, fire fast uh, is uh, has been a big learning for us that in the early days and, you know, I really had no idea what I was doing with with finding people having particularly not having a HR department or people to lean on that had done that before. And I was only fortunate that through our business coaching community, uh, one of the guys that I got introduced to was an organizational psychologist and helped us to really, you know, define roles, define the competence, the competencies that would um, drive success in those roles. And uh, and then we sort of built our interview process around that and, and that screening, because I think ultimately, like you get someone if they they might be a great person and a great worker, but just not a great fit for the business. And that's just a, a nightmare for everybody so it's worth taking the time and you can never bulletproof it I don't think well it's certainly not in my experience so far at least but uh you can you know you can do a lot to to make sure that the fit is there on both sides and uh, and on all levels as well yeah and I think I've learned a lot of lessons along my journey from you know people that I have worked out in the past of what hasn't worked and um, as I said I think you can really learn a lot from everyone and then kind of go, all right, in the ideal situation that it was my business, how then would I want that to work? Okay, that worked for that person, that didn't for that person, and then kind of mold an experience. And then I've also seen what they've done, again, on the accounting side. So that's been really important for me because, um, you know, in our office it's really fun. The jokes that flow around, it's really great. Um, it is a really nice environment to be in and we're very fearful of 
putting about Apple and it just you know, and it compromises that. I guess on the, on the contrary, you know, you meet someone, you get along great with them, great cultural fit. And I guess, you know, for the first three months, someone can hide their flaws pretty heavy, mm. um, what they can do. And, you know, I, I, so we're pretty good at picking a good cultural fit. I guess, you know, it's making sure someone can also deliver the good outcome for clients is the next Yeah, thing. I think that's where I think the competencies are all important because early days when we were hiring people that uh, what I've been told and what is definitely true is that um, you need to find someone that's got the right values to, to fit in with the business. But I had one experience where we hired um, someone and they were lovely, like they were great a great person bleeding our values like just so enthusiastic and cared about people but just didn't have the capability to to do the work and it got it, it became really really difficult because they were trying really hard and they they wanted to do all of the right things but they just couldn't do what we needed them to do and um in the end we we had to part ways and it was at that point that I realized well it's not like values are important, yes, but it's not just about them and values aren't enough. You've got to have the the capability and the competencies to be able to deliver on the outcomes as well. Yeah. You mentioned that you're, you're just uh, about to bring another advisor into the business. Mm-hmm. I'm keen to unpack that because I think it's a real pivotal, pivotal moment for, for a small business to, you know, make that decision and, and then start amplifying the advice work that's being done. How how have you approached that? You know, when did you know that the time was right? And then what have you done from there? Yeah, um, and it, again, it comes back to, you know, my business partner kind of pushing me. Yeah, I think my business partner, he's very forward thinking. He's a bit of a visionary. Um, he's got a very infectious kind of vibe and he's always going, look, look a year ahead. I, I really struggle with my two brains so I can get into deep worker mode or I can get into deep visionary. And I think my my vision hasn't been great because I've been in such worker mode. And he kind of pulled me up and he's like, you know, again, think of your head. What, what are you, where do you want to go? And let's start planning it now. So I think in around March, just with the sheer amount of capacity that I had and the amount of leads that I was getting and we are getting because at the moment my existing clients are referral machines. I think I'm roughly getting about two per week and it is extremely overwhelming. So I thought, okay, at this rate, I'm going to tap out here. Um, I personally, because I want to put efforts into other things, I didn't want more than 100 clients that I was looking after. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, essentially, I'm currently at 90 now on ongoing service agreements, and I've got a fair few transactional clients. So I'm pretty much capped out in my sense. Mm-hmm. And I thought, okay, where, what time do I want them to join the business? And how do I want that to look like? So first of all, I thought of what kind of person that I wanted in the business. And I wanted someone that wasn't a replica of me. I wanted someone that would complement my weaknesses. Um, I wanted someone that was super technical, detail-oriented, um, that also fit the values and things like that because I thought in the ideal world I want to be more on the forefront and I want to be able to bring someone in that I know and trust can deliver those outcomes from the back end. I had someone in mind um, within the network that I have, you know, I've known him personally for about four years, so he ticks all those boxes from a culture perspective Great human, bleeds the values. His why is so strong, and I think that's really important, making sure you have an advisor and their why is strong because if they're doing it for any other reason, it doesn't work out. They're like, what are you going to pay me? What's this? It's like you need to be a good advisor and the rest will just come. Um, So I agreed probably around March, April that I want another advisor, and I go, okay, I need to hit these clear targets in the business to be able to kind of afford that. So it's going, I didn't want to bring on someone, you know, when I was only at 50 clients and then be sitting there pulling their thumbs because obviously licensing, et cetera, it's quite costly, every advisor that you have. And at the time I was with another dealer group, I knew the cost outlay for another advisor. I couldn't bring someone on part-time as well. So it's going, all right, I need to actually ramp up to then be able to bring that person in. Um, We had a lot of discussions. That person will actually be coming in and set a really clear path 
for him to become partner. You know, at 12 and 24 months, we've got opportunities presented for him. I love and adore him personally, so I think he's going to be the great a great person for me to partner with. Whilst I've had an extremely great experience having accountants and business advisors as business partners, I also want that financial planner as well mm. to help me grow that. And obviously there's a lot of different ways that you can go about structuring those sorts of things. What what sort of resources have you drawn on to figure out what you think will work best for, for you guys? I think for me it's just making sure that I'm retaining talent. And I guess that's the thing that we had the discussion around. It's it's hard to do, you know, what if it goes wrong? What if it's not a good fit for the rest of the business? Um, you know, these are the things that have definitely kept me up at night and I've had multiple discussions with this other guy about, you know, mm-hmm. um, as he's coming into a business as well that it's not just me. I do have two other business partners and that's something he needs to be conscious of. So I need to make sure that he agreed with the vision, he aligned with them as well, um, and we've structured it so that we can obviously retain him. We've got about a 12-month period where we make sure the marriage is going to be right for each other. Mm. And then we've got a really clear, defined outline from that. I think that that vision piece is so important, particularly with the hire like that. You know, looking at where the, where the business is going. You know, what will, how will the role evolve over time? Let's make sure that they're comfortable with that because, with an advisor, as much as you know, there's not necessarily an obligation or a commitment to keep them long term. It's like you don't, you never want to bring an advisor into the business if it's not a long term um, play as well. And I think for us, that's been one of the, the game changes that uh, we've spent a lot of time to really understand people's motivations, where they want to be going from a career perspective, talking about where we want to go from a business perspective, and then making sure that that all lines up and that they're as excited about how that will go as they are about the role that they're coming in to fulfill in the in the shorter term. So. Um, yeah, I, I think definitely uh, has been a, a big game changer. And again, it doesn't guarantee success, but I think it goes a long way to identifying, you know, where there could be issues. And I, I certainly have seen that in the past that where that's not a line that you sort of, you're probably setting yourself up for failure a bit there yeah. as well. Because I, I think I just had those really frank conversations. What do you want? And sometimes it's not going, oh, I want the top end salary. Um, it's going, I want something I can grow myself. I want partner. And I think understanding those needs, if I didn't offer that solution, I know long term this wouldn't be the right fit for either of us because obviously I want to build, I see this person coming in and being kind of the operations manager of fin planning and then building out the teams and, you know, that type of thing. And I had that vision and I had to make sure he had that right vision yeah, as well. Totally. Morgan, a uh, bit of a random one, but what would you say for you has been the most difficult skill that you've had to master to be the advisor and the leader in the business that you are today? <laughs> Time management. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's probably my biggest pain point. Um, what's my the biggest skill? Um, being adaptable. and being open to change and being able to take other people's ideas and work with it. Mm. Yeah. 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 I guess definitely being adaptable. Um, you know, the world is constantly evolving. We as a profession are constantly evolving. And, you know, I've come into a business that's also constantly evolving and changing and clients' needs are changing. So I think being adaptable is really yeah. important. And I guess I never want to lose that. And what have you done? What have you done to work on that? If it's been a challenge to to get to where you are now, like what? How? Yeah, like what have you done to build that muscle for yourself? Oh, I think I've been developing it personally and professionally for years. I think it's just listening, understanding, not saying no, being open minded. Um, I'm always trying to develop myself. Um, I read a lot. I listen to a lot of podcasts, I study, I love human behaviour and things like that. So I think we're constantly evolving and growing as humans and I think I kind of just apply that to my life in general. Um, uh, another thing that we're talking about it is me in the business being a leader and not being a team member because I think that's a really big change for me 
you know, I've always been like, oh, I want to be the cool, fun one. And I still mm. try to be the cool, fun one. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I still have terrible jokes. But I think being a leader and leading by example for the other team members is super important because, you know, if the top end isn't right, it rots. It rots from kind of the head down. You know, even if I'm not having a great day, I still roll into work, smile on my face, keeping mm. the team keeping the rest of the team super positive, especially if we've got big deadlines because we've got a massive office. You know, as I mentioned, across the business in general, there's 24 team members. So if I rolled into there without, without a positive attitude, you know, it does kind of rot, rot all the way down. Yeah. I think making sure I'm a leader and leading from the front and leading by example for the rest of the team. Right, you can't be the do do what I say, not what I do thing. I don't, I don't think that that approach works works so much uh, across teams in yeah. particular. Definitely, was that change in mindset as well? You know, I I've always up until a year and a half ago, I've always been an employee. So it's completely changing that. Okay, I need to be a leader now. Yeah, it's a big shift. Morgan, my my last question for you is that if you could wind back the clock 18 months um, and do things differently, what would you change? Hmm. I would maybe have spoken to the marketing team and business partners to kind of position the planning, entering the business a little bit differently, make it far warmer, make sure clients knew it was happening because I guess I came in with an expectation going, you know, the 100 existing accounting clients, 100% going to be mine, um, going to look after them, going to be a smooth, mm. easy journey. It's been quite slow on that front because they're quite big clients, slowly bringing them over because I've really had to focus a lot of my resources on, you know, my beautiful referral partners, um, my existing clients. To have the growth that I've had, I've really had to work on that, you know, getting my existing clients to your referral machines. So I think I probably would have positioned it or had it, had those discussions with them to really pre-market the launch of the financial planning as opposed to, you know, I think it really got launched probably three months in already to the journey. Hey, we offer planning. Yeah. Um, so I would have done that differently. I don't think I would have changed anything else because I think all of the lessons and all the things I've learned along the way, I'm very grateful for them. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think that you've got to, you do have to learn those ones, and especially the painful lessons that sometimes, obviously, it's never good in the moment, but uh, then the pain is, is strong that uh, you make sure that it doesn't happen again or that you do take lessons as well. And I would agree with that uh, sentiment that you all all of those things that happen they build and it's all learnings there and there is no perfect way and that's why you know every advice business is a, is a little bit different and every person within an advice business is a little bit different as well so yeah uh, I, love I, kind of think, I kind of think everything's happened at, at the right time you know that mm. lesson happened super early on for me to learn that that lesson happened there to learn that and it's yeah. made me extremely resilient um I think any everything in life has made me extremely mm. resilient and that's my, I think, my advantage. Um, I would encourage other advisors that are looking at doing this. This is really, really get your support network around you. I, you know, I do lean, and I've always lent on my community heavily. You know, I've got great influences around me. My mentor gave me lots of tips and tricks. And going from a firm, I guess I've always kind of been alone in the roles that I've had anyway. But you are very alone. Mm. And if you don't reach out to those who can raise you up, you're in, I don't feel like you're going to have success. Just need to make sure you've got a great network in those off days that you're having. Make sure that they're picking you up and, hey, you're having this off day. Did you think about this? I think mm. that's really important. And also home, making sure you've got a great home life. My partner's extremely supportive. And, again, I don't think I could have put as many hours in or pushed as hard or kept as positive sometimes without, you know, that support there as well. And I think a lot of times these people have done it before as well when you lean on your network that uh, take the lessons there and you can shortcut your way um, uh, to the outcomes that you want as well. So I Absolutely. Love that. And I think I may have been, even been something that I was listening to from you, you know, one of the podcasts you did at the time when it was extremely important for me is I think you said it might have been you um, recruiting earlier 
before it's kind of too late going, all right, am I needing another person? And what time frame is that happening? And start yeah. it down, as opposed to recruiting when you're bursting at the seams and you've got no capacity to even think about training or. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's higher for, higher for growth, like build your team to grow, not build your team because you've grown and you have to, then you now have to stretch so much that you have to build a team. I think that's yeah. a good one. Not always easy, particularly in the early days when you're balancing out, you know, revenue and um, all of those sorts of things. But, yeah, it, it, it's an important thing to master for sure. Yeah, and I think it kind of motivates you, though, you know, if you're going, all right, like, for example, me bringing on um, this advisor, it's going, I don't have a full need to, um, you know, double my capacity, but it's going to push me so much harder to then, you know, expand and think, all right, how could I potentially market to do it? How can I do this kind of thing? It's really going to push me hard in the direction I kind of want to go anyway. Absolutely. Yeah, I, for, for me, every time I bring on a team member, I'm like, okay, now I'm going to get them busy. What am I going to do? Focus on that. Okay. Uh, and then you, it's, it's a strong motivation, especially when you're paying that, uh, that salary every month, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And also, I guess you're kind of responsible for other humans. It's kind of like, oh, it's not just myself, you know, um, I've got to keep these people alive. They've got families. and <laughs> Morgan, thank you so much for sharing your insights. So much gold there. And it's great to see you smash it. Uh, keep fighting the good fight. And thanks again. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ben. Catch you. Cheers, guys. We'll catch you next time.